I'm going to play a b3, a Nimzovich Larson, in Dr. Lono's honor. It's d5. Should be 2. Knight c6. Okay, so this is the first moment when there are, there are several possible variations. Uh, today I'm going to play this traditionally. So does anybody know what the traditional main line is in this position? What is white supposed to do? Yeah, so the move is e3. And as with all hypermodern openings, the point of this opening is not to control the center with pawns. It's to get your pieces out and put immediate pressure on black center. So that is, we got this bishop out to b2. Where does this bishop belong? Well, that is a very obvious question with an obvious answer, which is b5. We want to attack the knight, which is defending the pawn. And depending on how black, and black can get in big trouble here really quickly if he is not super careful because you could end up just losing a pawn here, bishop d6. Now, this is a pretty famous line, which again, could end very badly for black. What do we have to notice about this move is that it opens up a potential x-ray on that g7 pawn. If we capture it with the bishop, hypothetically, that means if the e-pawn moves or it disappears, we will potentially win a lot of material by taking g7. So the move knight f3 looks really good. It looks really natural. But black can actually play f6 and create a pawn chain that will make the e5 pawn very hard to pressure further. So we have to use our pawns here. We have to go f4. I'm sure this is a move a lot of you are familiar with. This idea occurs in many different openings that involve a fianchetto. We attack the pawn with our pawn, putting more immediate pressure than a knight would. Okay. So black has a pretty unenviable choice here. If he takes, I believe this line is just bad for black after bishop takes g7. He does have a check on h4, uh, but it's not scary. We just move our king there, and I don't think black has any initiative. Um, the move f6, I believe, is considered far better, but it still doesn't solve all of Black's problems. We can trade once, we open the f-file, and then knight f3 becomes a lot stronger. Well, I'm explaining the logic behind f4, right? You should understand, even if you're a beginner, you should fully understand this move. You're pushing out the pawn, it's untouchable, and pawns are the best way to pressure other pawns. Yeah, queen e7 is also possible, but then we play knight f3, it gives a check on h4 which obviously we need to block with a move g3. Thank you. There we go. Thank you, Happy Kabira. Happy Kabibara with a prime. I really appreciate it. Queen e7. I think this is the best line, actually, for white. Okay, so what do we do now? Do we want to take this pawn? Is that premature? Well, it's definitely premature to take. That defeats the whole purpose of what we're doing here, which is to put pressure on the pawn. By trading it, uh, we are giving black a get-out-of-jail-free card. Obviously, here we would just develop knight f3. Continuing to pressure the pawn. Okay, bishop g4, good move. Now, I think that there's a couple of ways to approach this position. Um, but we need to do some calculation here. So, what are the options? The first option is to deal with the immediate problem of this pin, which is very annoying. We cannot castle. We shouldn't castle because e4 becomes a possible potential problem. Even if black gives up g7, we don't want to give this knight away. So we can play the move h3 here, which essentially forces the bishop to capture the knight because he would get trapped if he go went to h5. The downside of that is that the knight was pressuring the e5 pawn. It's perhaps not ideal for us to trade it. Um... What is the second option here? What else can we do? No, we can't go d3 because he still goes e4. Bishop e2 is way too passive. I wouldn't move this bishop away. It's pressuring the knight. So the, the other move is f takes e5. Now I hear you thinking, didn't you just say this was a bad move? Well, the situation has changed. It was a bad move here because black would be able to take with the bishop and take the sting out of our bishop. Here, uh, it's a lot more complicated because after f takes e5, bishop takes e5, we play bishop takes e5, and he's unable to recapture with the knight. So 
this is this carries a lot more weight uh, now that the knight is on f3 than, than previously. All right. So again, just because a move is bad in one position, you know that you know the spiel doesn't mean it's bad in another. And important captures you have to evaluate and reevaluate on every move because the circumstances may have changed. Now, what should Black do after Bishop takes e5? Bishop takes e5. We'll see if he finds this. How should Black actually proceed here? And he can make this move immediately in this position, but it would be a grave mistake. Actually, maybe it wouldn't be. Oh, it's interesting. Bishop takes knight. Yeah, so after takes, takes, he should take the knight with a bishop. We have to respond to that by taking the bishop. And then the queen is able to take that bishop. But we have forced him to give away his strongest piece. So I still believe that white will be slightly better there. But that's totally what he should do. He, this is the only move for black. Okay, so hopefully I'm explaining things clearly for now. Let's see what black does. Okay, bishop f3 immediately. Now this is really interesting. Um, one of the most important things not to do in chess is assume that two different move orders lead to the same conclusion. When you have calculated something, your opponent makes a different first move. You always have to ask yourself, does this give me any other options? And even if the answer is no, it's worth thinking about for a little bit. And if you think about that for a little bit, you'll see that it in fact does in this position. You don't have to take this bishop. You can take the other bishop, not only attacking the queen, but most importantly, opening up the pressure on g7. So let's calculate. Pawn takes bishop. Bishop takes queen. Pawn takes queen. And it's in fact a double attack. We are attacking number one, the bishop on d1. Number two, we are threatening that old idea, bishop takes g7. So it's easy. Now, I, I left something out. Black has an additional move here. Let's see if he finds it. What should black try here? Who sees it? Do not assume that you have to capture the queen. You got to look around. Queen f6 is not possible because there's a bishop there. Queen e4. Queen e4 would be the most testing response. And it in fact, may seem that white is now losing after queen e4 because black forks the queen and the rook. But that's where things kind of get tactical and complicated. So we're going to wait to see what black does. And if he goes queen e4, then we're going to start thinking. I do see a response to queen e4, but I have to walk you through the logic. Thank you, Chris Link. Well, it's not too crazy. This is very easy to keep track of, right? Both queens are hanging and the bishop is hanging. So if he takes the pawn, we take the bishop. If he takes the queen, we take his queen. The other thing that's hanging is the g7 pawn. It's good in your mind just to keep a little tab open of everything that's hanging, just so you don't forget to capture something if you get the opportunity. We need four found. Now, situations like these, there are two main approaches. I mean, the first is to move our queen. We can go queen c1, but I don't like that. He takes the rook. And even though we technically could take on g7 and recover the rook, I, I'm really afraid for our king in that position. Remember, if he captures the rook, we won't be able to castle short. Now, a lot of you are coming up with the correct general idea. What if we counterattack his queen? That queen on e4 looks awfully vulnerable. Okay, so what about the move pawn to d3? Well, pawn moves weaken other pawns, and pawn to d3 gets checkmated. Queen takes e3. Not good. Well, we could try the move bishop d3, but as I said, uh, if possible, I don't want to move that bishop away from b5. That's an important bishop. Are there any other pieces which could attack black's queen? Well, look around the board. There is. Very nice, guys. Knight c3 is, I think, a very important resource. Again, we are counterattacking black's queen. It's easy to establish this line. Bishop takes d1, knight takes e4. The bishop is hanging, the knight is hanging, and the pawn on g7 is also hanging. So we don't even have to recapture the bishop there. We can take on g7. We'll be up in exchange at the end of the line. That's a nice move, but it's it's not so difficult to find if you know what to look for. Yeah, we could play d7 in between move, but I'm not sure ruining castling is worth giving up this pawn over. Because if we get into some endgame, you might envision a situation where g7 is hanging and the pawn actually threatens to capture c7, if that makes sense. And if the queens are traded, we will, we will regret having played d7 and bringing black skin closer to the center. 
Bishop d3, I don't believe is a better move, but maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe you check to the computer. Bishop takes d1. Knight takes c4, and I think we're winning. He takes c4. Now, what should we do? Should we take the bishop? And I already hinted at this. Well, this is a matter of understanding what the options are. Clearly, we should play bishop takes g7, although taking the bishop would have been amazing too. I mean, we would have been two pawns up there with two amazing bishops, but we can win the exchange here. Because black will not be able to get anything for that rook. Black will not be able to get anything for that rook. The best thing that he can do is go bishop f3. We can move the rook, and then we take on h8. Well, bishop takes c2 is not scary. It's just a pawn. We play bishop takes h8. Bishop f3. Now, what would be the best move here? Who sees kind of a sexy way to meet such a move? To clarify the rules, and first I'll let people find the move. Yeah, it's actually to castle. So castling is legal when the rook is attacked. It's just illegal when, it, when there's a check. Do not forget about that. Very often people just assume that they can't castle here because the rook's attacked, but that's not true. You can castle, and in fact you should, because this coordinates the rooks. And the king is very, very safe here for all of eternity. Yeah, so learning new things every day. That's why you should sub to this channel. No, just kidding. I would never. F6. Okay, so this is... Okay, let's take the rook. Um, this is the best attempt I think that black has. He is trying to trap our bishop. Um, I don't think that black is going to be successful, but in order to extricate it, we need to, we need to be creative. All right. So... First things first, I think we have a good check here. I think that the bishop has done its job. And um, I think we should begin by giving this check and creating pressure against the knight. That's not going to hurt. I think this move is just a helpful move. I don't know how we're going to follow it up yet, but let's start with that check. Now, the king's probably going to go to g6. If it goes back, then it would sever the connection with the rook and the bishop. Now... What really helps in such positions is first to ask yourself, what is black's next move going to be? What is black's next move going to be here? Well, it's going to be knight h6. It's not going to be knight e7 because there's a pawn on d6. So what is the drawback of the move knight h6? Is there anything that you notice let, let's imagine for a second that black it's black to move and he plays knight h6. What should we do in that position? How does black get the most for the, for the bishop? Like if we're already losing our bishop, we might as well give it up for a pawn, right? Um, and there is a way to do that. We can take that pawn on f6. I think all of you guys see that. Now, let's say it's black to move in this hypothetical universe. Knight h6, bishop takes f6, king takes f6. Well, what do we notice about that resulting position? Well, if you look carefully, you'll see that there's a rook and it's skewering, sorry, it's pinning the bishop on f3. That pin, however, does not seem effective. Why? Because there's a pawn on e4 that's guarding the bishop, and our pawns are too far advanced to attack that bishop. So that bishop seems entirely safe. But pawns can be, uh, can be dismantled. And so, according to that logic, the best move here would be d3. Play d3 in order after knight h6, bishop takes f6, king takes f6, to have the move d takes e4, and the bishop is lost. Yeah, bishop d5 might have been even better. I I completely missed that move, to be honest with you. I completely missed bishop d5. But this is not such a long line. I'm, I'm walking you through the logic. I saw d3 very quickly, because I saw the idea of taking on f6 immediately. And the move d3 follows logically from that, because you got to dismantle the defender of the bishop if you're going to try to win it. Okay, but I, I don't like the phrase, I never would have thought of that. This is contrary to my my point, my basic speedrun understanding. Okay, actually he's doing something really smart. Or not. Wait, no, we have a move here. Okay, so what do we do now? We have, we've succeeded in getting that bishop out of f3. We need to pounce on our opportunity. 
Yeah, we take the knight. This is easy. Take the knight, take the pawn. We've extricated our bishop. We're up in exchange, and the game is essentially over. So the phrase I never would have thought of that. That's why I try to spell out the exact logic to, to show you that maybe if you beef up your understanding that one day you'll be able to come up with these ideas. They're not as impossible as they seem. So this is winning. This is winning. Chess is a logical game at most sort of levels of understanding. And he resigns. Yeah, this position is resignable. It's not an exchange. Okay, I will, because I was explaining things in a lot of depth, I will take questions, but I won't like fully recap everything. So first question, Cesar asks, was bishop f3 a viable response? Thank you, Olegim. After you took the queen with the knight. He would have forked your rook and knight, and I think the knight was undefended. Yeah, so you're, it would have been a viable defense, but it was very likely to transpose into the game. So one thing I could do here, probably not the best thing, but I could even castle in this position. And if he takes the knight, you will notice that this is the exact same position as in the game. So it doesn't really matter whether he takes the knight first or drops the bishop back first, because we're not taking the bishop anyway. We were taking the pawn. I guess bishop f3 gives white less of a choice. But that's the answer. Whoa! Tons of subs. Deutsch Blitz with a prime. Bloomington Pilot with a prime. Thank you. Let's get the party started. Could Can you walk through bishop d4 over d3? Oh yeah, bishop d5 you mean. Couldn't he just move the queen instead of going to the queen trade? So that's a great question. Where could this queen go? There are only two squares from which the queen actually maintains its defense of the bishop. The first is queen f5. What should be white's response to queen f5? What should we do here? And if you solve, if you solve your tactics, you'll see this move. It's, you have to notice that to any two pieces that are aligned on the same file, castles is the best. Or rook f1, but as we've discussed, it's better to castle. Boom. It's over. We are skewering and winning everything. What is the other move? The other move is queen g4. What should we do here? And I think queen g4 would have been the best move, relatively speaking, but it doesn't solve all of black's problems. Here we go bishop e2, because now the queen is in the same diagonal as the bishop. After bishop takes e2, queen takes e2. Queen takes e2 check. Who can tell me what we should take the queen with? And there's a very famous game on this topic that I could show you guys. Um, we should, of course, take with the knight. In general, in the end game, taking with the king is a good idea, because you bring it closer to the center. But here, you have to forget, or remember that the pawn on g7 is hanging. So by taking with the knight, we are creating a double threat of taking on c7 and taking on g7. And we're going to be up a pawn in the end. Black is going to win back that uh, pawn on... Um... Sorry, let me remember this game. It's a very short game. It's not a Trojan Re. I'm trying to remember this game, which featured a very similar idea. Oh, yeah, this one. Resurvive against Kupratrick. That's the famous one. Okay. Rezuvayev against Kupraychuk. All right. So Rezu both of these are, are very, very strong Soviet players. They're playing under 18 in Croatia. Um, no, not Croatia. I don't know where Dubna is. So uh, at this point, they're both very, very strong. And there have been several games which have gone exactly in this way. So it's in English. C4, E5. Black plays the move F5, which is still very popular. D4, E4. Bishop, G5. Um, knight f6. And here, uh, white initiates this interesting idea. White plays d5, which I know you guys have seen this kind of idea before. You were counterattack last night. Okay. E takes f3. Right? D takes c6. And f takes g2. In this position, white can take back on g2, but then white will end up a pawn down. So the typical reaction here is to take on d7 with check. And after bishop takes d7, bishop takes g2, the position is very unclear. What did white miss? What did white miss? You have to think outside the box here. It's not king e7, come on. 
Well, queen takes spawn is not so impressive. Queen takes spawn, I take the queen, and then I take on g2, and we get an endgame. So queen takes spawn is possible, but it's not so impressive. The move is knight takes d7, and white resigned. Uh, because white loses at least a piece. This is a brilliant move. Remember that this pawn is threatening to take the rook and make a new queen. So white has to take it, but then white loses on g5. And a couple of very strong players lost in exactly this way. This is not the only game from this position. Uh, so just remember the idea of like basically making a second threat with a capture. Um, it's a good idea to just like file away into your mental database. Yeah, knight takes d7 and, and the game is over. Okay, so you can kind of see the similarity. We take on e2, we create another threat, and therefore we guarantee that we're able to take c7. Okay, so we have spelled out both possible queen retreats and what we would have done against them, and this is just game over. Yeah, queen takes e3 will lose a piece, though. This is a desperado, but you only win a pawn, and you lose the bishop. All right, guys, I think... I've basically covered most of people's questions about this game. Um, I will call it a night here. It's been a pretty long stream, four hours plus. So again, I want to thank everybody for the subs. It really, really helps for the awesome support. We had some great matches, Hikaru, tons of other players. So I'm really happy at the chess today.